A few years ago, I was involved in writing something called the Reactive Manifesto. This was in part based on the experience of my team building a financial exchange and coming up with what was to us a fairly innovative approach to its architecture. This was the nicest big system that I've ever worked on or seen. I've spoken about aspects of this before, but the architecture that we ended up with was really close to a specialised form of an actor-based system. It's a weird name for an approach, and I think that it's not as widely known as perhaps it should be. But I think that perhaps the time for actor-based systems might be coming again. This is an interestingly different way to think about problems, and for many classes of systems it solves a lot of otherwise very difficult problems. So what are actors, and how do they help us to build great systems? Hi, I'm Dave Farley of Continuous Delivery. Welcome to my channel. And if you haven't been here before, please do hit subscribe. And if you enjoy the content today, hit like as well. I'd like to thank SWIM, the producers of the actor-based runtime framework of the same name for sponsoring this video. Many of today's real-world software as a service applications are event-driven. Actor-based applications analyzing huge amounts of data from real-time event sources. SWIM is an open source Java runtime which lets you easily create an actor for each event source. Each actor continuously analyzes events and streams its insights to other actors that link to it. SWIM applications run at CPU and memory speed, so are millions of times faster than disk, and are resilient and scalable. Go to swimos.org to learn more, and there's a link in the description below if you'd like to explore. The idea of organising systems around collections of actors is a surprisingly old one. It was first mentioned in 1973, and lo like lots of ideas in computer science, it was first thought of in the context of AI research at the time. The AI link, though, I think is a bit confusing because this is really quite a low-level kind of thing in some ways. Actors are primarily an approach to dealing with concurrency. They are simple but a powerfully effective way of organising our work that allows us to almost effortlessly parallelise it. But they do need us to think a little differently about how we organise our code to achieve that. As I've said many times here, concurrency is one of the really difficult problems in software. It's the root of nearly everything that makes our job genuinely difficult. When we have information in multiple places, which copy is correct? Which one is the most up to date? If I change my copy, how do we change yours too? How do we join up the work that your code is doing with mine? These are the problems at the heart of computing. Actually, it goes deeper than that. These are the problems at the heart of dealing with information in any form. All of these problems are just as relevant to information on bits of paper as to the contents of our database, databases or services. Actors don't solve all of these problems automatically, but they allow us to write code that can ignore them to a large extent, or at least reduce their impact, and that's quite a big win. So, what is an actor? Technically, an actor is a universal primitive for concurrent computation. In practice, what this means is that an actor is a single-threaded piece of code. Information comes into an actor, is processed on a single thread, and then information is sent out from the actor again. If you want an actor to do two things, you wait for it to complete the first before it's allowed to start work on the second. These inputs and outputs are described as messages, and these messages are the only communication that's allowed. No shared data, no backdoor access, all information flows in, to, and out of an actor as a message. If a message arrives while the actor is busy, the message is queued up until the actor is ready to work on it. For some implementations, these queues are sometimes called an actor's mailbox. This is a all lovely and simple. An actor waits for a message, does something useful, and then transmits another message in response. Notice, I haven't said anything about how the actor works internally, except that from the outside, the input, processing, and output happen in sequence. 
In response to a message, an actor can do three things. Create more actors, send messages to other actors, or designate what to do with the next message when it arrives. Mostly, this last one means it changes the state of the actor. So yes, actors are, can be, and are usually stateful. The really nice thing about this as a programming model is that a single actor processing a single message is a deterministic thing. Given a starting state and a message, we'll always end up with the same result. It's single-threaded after all. So these things are incredibly testable. So what's the difference between a method or function call and a message? Well, there's no return value for a message. The response from a, of an actor to a message is one or more of the things that I've already mentioned. A change in state, another message, or more actors. Technically, the important point here is that in sending a message, the sender does not transfer the thread of execution onto the receiver. This seemingly simple technical step has a lot of really nice consequences. It means that an actor can send a message and then continue doing useful work without waiting for any kind of response. It also means that a different actor can handle the response to the one that initiated the action if needed. Actors are decoupled from one another in both time and location. The location part is really interesting too. The computer science of actors talks about their addressability, but addressability doesn't necessarily mean fixed addressing. This is rather like the difference between an old landline style phone and what we call a phone now. In the old days, if you called somebody, you knew where they were, because where they were in space, because they were answering the phone. The route to their phone was fixed by the landline. Now, when you call someone, they could be anywhere. Actors need a way to communicate and something needs to do the same job as the mobile phone network to locate them. But that could be fixed like the landline or like the mobile phone system, entirely dynamic. It can also be point to point or broadcast. If the addressing is based on topics that actors are interested in, for example, like publish and subscribe messaging, then the actors can join and leave conversations when they need to. So now we have this potentially massively parallel, decoupled, decentralized, time and location independent model for computing. All based on the simplest of simple programming models. Take some input, process it, send some output. Listen for a message, process it and respond in any of those three ways. Oh, and there's no shared data anywhere. No concurrency primitives like locks or synchronization blocks, at least non-visible to the actor. There may be some cleverness in the infrastructure, but from the actor's perspective, no shared state of any kind. As I said, originally this was designed as a model for low-level concurrency. Later developments like Erlang introduced more ideas, ideas like the supervision systems. Once our actors are decoupled in time, errors don't automatically propagate. This is a good thing. It means that we can deal with them differently and depending on the nature of the error. If there's a problem processing a message but the actor is still fine, then it could send a new message indicating the error or perhaps create a new actor to deal with it. If the actor is broken because of some unexpected problem of some kind, this is a different kind of failure, and in this case we could designate a supervisor whose job it is to monitor what's going on uh, and decide what to do when things go wrong. It could stop a stored process, or start a new one, for example. There are some small differences, but this is very similar to the reactive systems that are described in the reactive manifesto. All this stuff adds up to a, the most robust programming model for programming complex distributed systems that we have. This is how things like telecoms exchanges work. The Ericsson Class 5 voice switch works exactly in this way, built with Erlang, an actor-based programming language. This is also how my team built one of the world's highest performance financial exchanges a few years ago. The actor model is widely used in big complex systems that value reliability, high performance, or the elegantly simple programming model highly. 
I think that this approach has some really interesting properties of value far beyond esoteric use cases. Actors are already used in a lot of mainstream applications. The Xbox game Titanfall, for example, uses actors based on the Orleans framework, and Twitter is built on Acker, another actor-based framework. But still, I think it's less widely thought of than perhaps it should be. Let's just recap that list of properties that I mentioned earlier. We have a massively parallel, decoupled, decentralized, time and location independent model for computing here. All based on the simplest of programming models. Does that sound familiar at all? Doesn't that rather sound like the sort of thing that we might want to use the cloud for, but with the benefit of this simple programming model? We are moving or have moved in the direction of a much more decentralized world of computing. We create small pieces of code that respond to events and process them, serverless functions tied to an event stream, for example. Web services responding to requests. In implementation, most of these are still tied to a request response kind of model for computing. And certainly models of computing like the function as a service of serverless are often seen as the best implemented as stateless systems. But what if they weren't? What if these things were all actors? Well, the first gain would be that, th that we wouldn't really care where the processing took place. We could leave that as a problem for the messaging infrastructure. If my actor needed to talk to yours, I could write the code so that it, I send, send a message that you receive. If your actor was running on the same machine as mine, the message could be a local call that the infrastructure would detect the fact that it was local and communicate using local technologies to make that fast and efficient and simple. On the other hand, if your actor was running somewhere else, the message remains the same from my point of view when I send it and from your point of view when you receive it. But the infrastructure then communicates across the wide area network and gets the information to you sometime later and everything still works as before. So the actors remain are both unchanged. This is a problem for the communications infrastructure, rather like your mobile phone answering my call, whether you're sitting next to me or on the opposite side of the planet. I've spoken here before in the context of reactive systems about how systems like this achieve a fantastic separation between the essential complexity of our systems and their accidental complexity. This seems to me like a great tool, a great opportunity for the creators of the public cloud systems that we increasingly depend upon. They could raise the level of abstraction to further generalize the technical features of our systems while allowing actor builders, us, to more clearly focus on the essential job at hand. Writing code that solves the problems for our users or writing code that our users enjoy while not needing to worry too much about threads and processes, locks, clustering or even persistence at the point when we write the, and test our actors. You can take this idea a very long way. When we built our exchange, our services knew nothing about our infrastructure. Nothing. There was no compromise in the design of the interface to one of our services. No additional functions were demanded by the infrastructure. All of the accidental complexity of message delivery, message persistence, clustering, failover, load balancing, sharing of data and so on were external to the services themselves. As ever, there are costs to this model. Perhaps the most complex one is how do you migrate state? If my actor is stateful and I want to change its internal representation, how do I do that? If my messages are assured in delivery, that means that they're pers persisted somewhere. So if I want to change the structure of a message, how do I do that? And the other problem is if I need to coordinate the actions of multiple actors in some way to ensure that their data is consistent, then how do we do that? All of these are solved problems and usually supported in some way by the infrastructure 
uh, provided by your, your, your infrastructure supplier. Snapshotting and replay for the first example. Message migration or phased interface changes for the second, perhaps. And distributed consensus protocols like Raft for the third. My crystal ball is no clearer than yours, so I don't know if the cloud builders will take this route. There's been some talk recently of stateful serverless approaches uh, uh, and provision of those kinds of services. That's, they sound very intriguing, uh, but they are pretty early on in the stage of development so far. Certainly, with my bias, these may be interpreted as representing an actor-based approach. But I think that actors are a fascinating approach to computing in general and provide us with a powerful but simple model, allowing us to build genuinely complex but extremely robust systems while focusing primarily on the problem that's in front of us, rather than the technical plumbing. Actors do this better than any other approach that I know of. They allow us to focus on the essential parts of the problem that we're working on while deferring and often generalizing the more technical bits. I think that this is a very strong candidate for an even more widely used programming model in the future. It's certainly one to watch. Thank you very much for watching.